Hello you primitive screwheads, listen up, I've got a top five list video for you. Two reasons really. One, people love, fucking love list videos. Honestly, there's a top five birthday cakes list video on YouTube. Why? I don't know. That's not the reliable content that I come to YouTube for. I want to listen to a bearded man shout and get really over animated about magic cards. The second reason is that War of the Spark is here and it is making fucking waves in the pretty much every format going. If you don't know, I'm Vince, also known as Peasant Kenobi on the internet. I'm the Magic the Gathering content creating equivalent of getting caught taking a shit on your neighbor's lawn first thing in the morning. Sometimes you get caught, sometimes you forget to go and you leave and you can't get back in because you've, you've put your keys away in your bag and then you just fucking, you just shit. You just shit on the lawn and then your wife's disappointed and... This list is of the top five War of the Spark cards that will kill you. Primarily in eternal formats, but I'll be talking a little bit about standard. So this video could also be called, Buy Your Fucking Foils of These Cards Now Before They Go Up. So I'm going to be talking about the cards and how they're making waves in modern and legacy, a little bit of vintage, but also some of these cards are going to be pretty good in standard. If they're not good now, they're going to be good later. When a card does well in a wider format with a larger card pool, it's either for one of two reasons. Firstly, it's because the card is fucking good. Like, it's powerful. It's powerful enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the other magic cards from throughout Magic's history. Or two, it synergizes very well with other cards in that format. Like, Brainstorm wouldn't be that good in standard, but once you add fetch lands and shuffle effects, well, it gets really, really good. So there's a good chance if these cards are making waves in modern or in legacy, then they're gonna be good in standard. Number five goes to the only card on the list that isn't going to make waves in eternal formats unless I fucking play it for a meme video and win a couple of games. It's Parhelion. Is that how you pronounce it? Parhelion 2. A card that is pretty shit. I mean, somebody's going to stick it in the commander deck somewhere. Someone's going to play it for a joke, right? Because, you know, YOLO. It's cool. It's flavorful. I fucking love the art. But... It's not exactly a legacy staple. But that said, you will fucking die to it, or you might have already died to it. At the pre-release, you know, the game's grinding out, you've got a 6-6 six, six worm in play and a 3-2 common wolf, and your opponent hits that 8th land drop, and they serendipitously, is that the word I'm looking for? Hang on a second. No, ceremoniously, that's what I want. So they, they fucking with psh, abandon, they slam 8 mana, and they slam Parhelion down, and you look down at those comments and you're like, fuck! So you fast forward a couple of weeks, you're at your draft at your local game store, or your local game stores, and you're drafting, and you see Parhelion, and you think, you know what? Timmy got me on pre-release, I'm gonna get him back. Fast forward a few hours, and you're just sat there, and you've got five lands in play, and you've got Parhelion in hand, and you're dying. You're literally dying to a 3-2 common wolf and a 6-6 six, six worm and they can't cast your Barhelion. And the funny thing is, you're dying to it. You're dying to it, but it's not even in your opponent's deck. Geist of Saint Aircraft kills people. Fuck you, Parhelion. Number four, Vivian, Champion of the Wilds. People are sleeping on Vivian at the moment. She's inherently a very good Planeswalker for three mana. She's very strong in creature-based mid-range. I can see her seeing some play, maybe not huge amounts, but some play in standard. But mainly where I've been playing her is Maverick in Legacy. She performs multiple roles within the deck. Firstly, you can flash shit in, so getting to flash in a Leovold in response to a Brainstorm. I think my camera's a little bit wonky. I think it's a bit wonky. Yeah. But it also means you can keep up Caracas, Wasteland, and Plowshares, and similar, or even just bluff them against lands, show and tell, or dark depths. I was going to say Reanimator there, but Reanimator just fucking kill you on turn one anyway. Then end step, bang, Knight of the Reliquy. Bang! Scrib Ranger. Okay, Scrib Ranger's already got Flash. That's not the point. She also allows you to dig deeper into your deck to find the silver bullets like Quasali Boyd Mage, Thalia Garden of Thraben, Garak Teague, or Scavenger News. And once exiled, you can cast those cards for the rest of the game, even when she dies. It's not part of her, it's a part of the ability resolving. So if she gets killed in combat, you still have a, a, a tank of gas that she sort of set up for you. She banks you while you for you to use later. She's fucking great. So you can get wheeled, you can get hymned, you can get fucking thought seized, but the cards stay in exile where you can play with them. So outside of really weird fringe corner cases, they, the cards can't be interacted with by your opponent. However, they don't have flash if she dies. Remember that, I found that out the hard way. The real, like, hard way. I lost. When I say real hard way, I mean I lost. That's not really that hard. In the grand scheme of things, it could have been 
a lot worse. She also gives creatures vigilance and reach, effectively protecting herself, but also allowing you to block Delvers, Terramanders, and even Marriott Lages with a fucking Noble Hierarch. Or with a Knight of the Reliquary, you can attack, get some damage in, block, and still get to activate them to grab a land. The synergy is fucking great. Same with Jitte. Traditionally, Sarah Avenger has been very good in Death and Taxes because it can attack and block with Jitte on it, which can just end games, even against the bigger creatures like Gourmet Angler in the format. But now, anything can go both ways, if you'll excuse the turn of phrase. She really is a powerful walker at 3 mana where you can cast her on turn 2 off the Mana Dork. I tried her a little bit in Modern, in Green, White, Death and Taxes, a vileless version, after chatting on the Discord about it, the, the Death and Taxes Discord. And it was a bit shit. I think the deck is just not powerful enough in the degenerate shit show that is modern. Uh, so that's why it felt a bit underwhelming. I think perhaps a Greenwood Value Town Company deck might might use her better. Uh, I will be trying her more. There will be videos with her on the channel soon. I'll keep your eyes peeled for that. Ugin the Ineffable in at number four. Showing up in multiple Eldrazi and Cloudpost lists over the course of the last weekend's Legacy Challenge. Like he had some, like five, six, I think six copies in the top eight. That's quite a few. Ugin with the funny name that makes it sound like he just can't be fucked, no matter how hard you woo him, take him for dinner, and treat him like the beautiful spirit dragon that he is. Softly, you answer his questions, you cradle him when he sobs at night, and protect him from his past, from his abusive brother. What, um, wait a minute, what, what, what were we talking about? Magic? Oh yeah, he makes Eldrazi, big and small, cost less. He makes other colourless walkers and artifacts cost less. He also fucking makes bodies and kills coloured permanents. He is strong like a bull, and being colourless makes him easy to cast off of cloud posts and fast mana from mana box and, and perhaps even Tron lands. He's such an easy including variant of Tron or Legacy 12 post that I'm honestly surprised that other cards in the set are coming out to be more powerful and push him down to third place on my list. But boy oh boy, do we have some deceptively powerful cards coming up in this list. Teferi Time Raveler. So this card is being played in Esper Control in Standard, so that's one tick right there. He also made second place in Blue White Control in the Modern Challenge this weekend, so there's another tick. And people are playing him alongside Narset, the new three mana uncommon Narset in Legacy Miracles as well. Now Narset probably deserves to be on this list, but she's not uncommon, she's not going to really climb to any high value, perhaps the foils will command a bit of a price, so I'm putting them both on the list together. Teferi is a control hoser. He turns off opposing force of wills and absorbs depending on the format, whilst also allowing you to cast your wraths or perhaps even your ponders in your opponent's turn. That alone makes him very, very good for a three mana investment, but wait, there is more. His down tick can bounce creatures, artifacts and enchantments. Wow. That is some versatile shit. You can bounce your own Oath of Kaya or your own Snapcaster Mage to reuse it in a pinch. Or how about that Conclave Tribunal that White Dex insists is still worth running in the face of gods like Kefnet? On a side note, Kefnet's really fucking good. I don't think she's legacy or modern good, but as a one of in control decks and standard, I think she might be good enough to grind out Esper or just get in the way of red decks. Anyway, Teferi helps you to temporarily deal with annoying permanents that aren't planeswalkers. But wait! There is more! If all things I just mentioned were it, then the card would be good, but probably too fair to risk the mana investment in Modern or Legacy. But his down tick, the minus three bounce ability, it draws a fucking card. That's right, the new Teferi replaces himself, as well as giving you an element of disruption or interaction and turning off your opposing opponent's control magic. And by control magic, I mean counter spells. I'm just very. I'm very excited today. Further to that, remember kids, it's up to one target. If the board is clear, you can still draw a card. And remember my friends, where is a planeswalker most comfortable? On a clear, open battlefield, devoid of pesky attacking critters. It looks like Wizards of the Coast continue the habit of printing very, very strong to fairies. He isn't quite here of Dominaria because he doesn't provide his own slow, cumbersome, death by a thousand fucking paper gut style win condition, but he sure is a fantastic piece of utility. If you are somehow sleeping on this card, fucking stop. Go buy them now. Perhaps actually wait for them to dip. I mean, War of the Spark is being opened a lot now, so cards have room to go down. But once War is being opened so much and the Horizon hype period starts, or we get onto the next standard set, Teferi has room to go up, especially the foils. I think Teferi is going to be playable in standard at the very least, as long as his big brother Hero of Dominaria is legal. But beyond that, yeah, he's, he's going to be a mainstay of modern and legacy control unless those formats change drastically in the next couple of months. It's not like we've got a new set coming that might... Oh, Oh my god, it's here! Oh my god! And at number one we have the one, the only, the greatest creator in the multi- Oh, uh, uh, wait, what? What? 
Oh, sorry, not the greatest. He's the second best. I'm the greatest creator of the multiverse, you fucks. It's Khan, the great creator. And now, I know what you're gonna say. If Teferi is so fucking gas, what can be better? How about a car that wins you the game on the turn after you've cast it with a small amount of setup and the need to invest six mana on the following turn? Six mana win the game sounds pretty solid. Am I right? So this is Khan, the great creator. I've been singing his praises and sucking on that metallic teat since before his release. But before we get to the lock, let's talk about him without Microsynflatus in the equation. He stops artifacts from working, so he turns off Aether Vials, Walking Ballistas, Lion's Eye Diamonds, or in Vintage, Moxon and Black Lotus. Sometimes, to win a game of Vintage, all you need to do is slam Null Rod, and sometimes that Null Rod costs 4 mana. And sometimes that Null Rod is a one-sided Null Rod, so your mocks still work. Fucking get wrecked. But beyond that, he can also turn non-creature artifacts into bodies that can attack, so if you want your ensnaring bridge to get bolted, go ahead. Khan is the first Planeswalker to be able to wish for things. His minus 2 looks for a card outside of the game or an exile that is an artifact and puts it into your hand. This means you can go get your plowed Frexian Revoker or your pathed Walking Ballista I guess or something else of minor value but really what that means is you can go into your sideboard and you can grab a silver bullet. Now in modern if you've assembled Tron you have seven mana. Khan costs four. A little bit of quick maths leaves you with three. Three mana. That means you can go grab a bridge, a trinosphere, or maybe even a crucible of worlds if you want to hit more mana for Eldrazi the following turn. Or coming back to it, the, the, the draw of the card, Mycosynth Lattice. Now this card has been a combo card in Commander for the longest time. It only recently got a second reprint in Battle Bond, if you include Battle Bond being recent. I guess, once you start to get old, everything feels recent. No, I'm only kidding, I'm only 21. With Khan in play and Alatus on the board, your opponent's lands can no longer tap for mana. Their planeswalkers can't be activated. They can't use or anything a bar attacking. Once the board is cleared and you're not being attacked, it's a hard lock. Your opponent dies, unless they can float mana and ass blast the lattice after it resolves, of course. Seriously though, all green black X decks should be playing multiple ass blasts now. I'm calling it. If you're playing Maverick, Trimmer Plowshares, play an Ass Blast. It's gonna do fucking wonders against these Planeswalkers, and it's gonna do fucking wonders against Microsoft Blasts as well. Now, if you think this sounds cute and not good enough to play, allow me to present you with some evidence. The winner of yesterday's Legacy Challenge, three new Khan, three new Ugin. Hmm, fourth place. Two new Khan, two new Ugin. But what else was in the top eight, I hear you ask? Well, two Maverick decks and a DNT deck. Wasteland decks that prey on Cloudpost. This is a new meta game emerging simply because Khan is that fucking good. Khan is here to stay. He might be the new hotness for a while, but he is a clear part of the legacy meta game now. I would go as far as to say that if Wasteland decks can't keep the post decks in check, then Khan might get Microsoft Lattice banned. I'm not saying that's a certainty. I don't want to be hyperbolic. Although, oh no, of course I want to be hyperbolic. It's fun. But more so, this is a distinct possibility. We might see Microsoft Lattice banned in legacy. What the fuck is going on? Only time will tell how oppressive Khan ultimately feels in the format. So that's my list of five cards you should probably go and buy, and five cards you're gonna definitely fucking die to in Eternal Formats. A little bit of standard in there as well. I've been Vince, also known as Peasant Kenobi on the internet. Let me know if I've missed something in the comment section below. What are your five picks from this set? Is there anything that I haven't said already? Don't forget to like the video and share it as well. Put it on your local Facebook group, show your friends that you're LGS. Please share the videos. If you can't support me financially through Patreon or subscriptions on Twitch, the best way to help out the channel grow is just to share my videos. Until next time, don't shit on your neighbor's lawns and don't try to court a mythical, mystical, legendary spirit dragon who's just not fucking into you, okay? It's not worth your time. Trust me, I've been there. Ta-ta for now. Thank you.